Good afternoon my friends, this is Krebs here and today we're going to be doing another World of Tanks tank review. In this episode we're going to be taking a look at the tier 2 French tank destroyer that is the Renault FTAC. In the last episode, if you haven't watched it already, go watch it! It's a good episode! We were taking a look at the tier 1 French uh, Renault FT-17 or more properly known as the Renault FT. And we had a choice between going down four different lines. We could have gone for the D1, the BS, the Renault FTAC, or the H35. And as you can probably tell by now, I chose the Renault FTAC. Krebs, why did you go for that tank? We wanted to see some rubber duckies. Well, it's because, most logically to me, I know rubber duckies would be fun, like the B1, but... Uh, <laughs> What's most logical to me is that the Renault FTAC sits nice and conveniently at the top of the tech tree, so that's why I went up uh, for this tank. And that's what we're going to be doing this time. So, just before we get on to the actual episode, I want to apologize with you guys. I want to get uh, to your same level. I want to say sorry for the lack of videos in the last few days and last few weeks. <laughs> uh, the whole reason why I've not been making many videos is because I'm going to be graduating from uh, pharmacy pretty soon. I'm going to be getting my master's in pharmacy in the oncoming weeks. And over this coming week, I've got some of my last assessments going on. So I need to get my head down, my books, just make sure that, you know, my future is going to be all set. And so that's why I've been putting off this off to the side a little bit. But I'm really, really keen on getting back into it because I love finding history out about these tanks and so on and so forth. But anyway, without further ado, let's get on to the show. So what we'll be talking about is the history of the tank. I'm going to be talking about some statistics and number crunching. You guys love numbers. So the offensive and defensive capabilities of the tank along with comparing that to another alike tank. And then at the end, we're going to be doing some gameplay footage that shows off the tank in a good light. Okay, so away we go. History, history, history. I'm going to be quite frank with you guys right now. There's not that much to talk about with this tank. It was a pure concept design tank. There, it didn't even feature on the battlefield. There wasn't even a prototype. It got to the drawing board and never went farther than that. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to give you some epic story like the Bear of Kin Men running out of shells and crushing infantry and making a name like that. Unfortunately, that doesn't really happen with this tank. But I still have, uh, I can still talk about why it became a concept in the first place. Why did it get even to the drawing board and why didn't it go, uh, it go farther than that? But, uh, let's start off with some nomenclature. So the Renault FTAC. AC stands for anti-char, which in French means anti-tank. So think of it as the Renault FT anti-tank and hence why it's a tank destroyer. Now, if you watched my last episode with the Renault FT, you would know that by the break of World War II, the tank was just obsolete. By 1940, the French had about 543 of these uh, Renault FTs in their arsenal, and they had to say to themselves, well, we've got so many of these obsolete tanks laying about, maybe there's something we could do with them, maybe we can upgrade them. And so that's why the task was given to the designer Artillier de Petou to come up with something uh, with a few exact specifications, and those specifications were to bring it up to par against the uh, certain light tank destroyers for the Germans, namely the Panzerjäger 1 and also the Martyr. And some of these features had to include having the same sort of armor as those tank destroyers and also firepower akin to it. And apart from that, it had to have a elevation and depression arc of plus or minus 15 degrees, which actually, this is an interesting fact, you'll see how World of Tanks actually didn't make it anything close to that range, or else it'd be too epic. But uh, apart from that, also they had a traverse arc of 6 degrees, which is meant to be a specification as well. But the whole reason why the tank never actually made it onto the battlefield, or even a prototype, was because it was just deemed too slow. The biggest problem was that it reached only about seven and a half kilometers per hour. That was just, it was far too slow. What the French needed was something mechanized, something more mobile than a sitting duck like this, essentially. And that's why they came up with the Lorraine. They had the Lorraine 39 LAM already in their arsenal. Uh, and they had some other vehicles that aren't in World of Tanks, mostly armored vehicles, that they would have preferred to use rather than this sluggish uh, thing. I don't even know what to call it. 
this thing, mutant almost. <laughs> and so that's why I never made it onto the battlefield. So sort of a sad story of the Reino FTAC, but hey ho, life sucks and you just move on. Now let's get onto some number crunching. Just before we get onto comparing this tank to an alike tank, I thought we'd compare it to the Reino FT, the tier 1. I'm not going to post the stats in front of the screen like I normally do because I'm only going to be listing off a few values here, but it's just to compare what did World of Tanks do to this tank to make it more of an improvement over the Reino FT. And in terms of health points, it has an extra 5 health points, which, you know, no big whoop. Speed limit is exactly the same for both tanks at 21 kilometers per hour. Uh, armor is exactly the same, 60 millimeters all the way around. But this is the problem. The Reno FTAC is a slow bugger. It has 45 horsepower as opposed to 100 horsepower on the Reno FT. So it means it's gonna have slower traverse, or not traverse, sorry. It's gonna have slower acceleration. Uh, and you can definitely feel it in this tank. But on the bright side, it has much better armaments. Uh, in fact, it does about twice the amount of damage as the Reno FT per minute. Um, and it also has better camouflage values. Of course, it's the tank destroyer. So that is the improvement over the Reno FT. And so since we've already been talking about the historical aspects of the tank and how it had to compare against the Martyr and the Panzerjäger 1, I think it kind of makes sense if we compared it to, say, the Panzer Jaeger 1, the Tier 2, rather than the Tier 3 Martyr 2. I can leave that one for another day, but the Panzer Jaeger 1, in my opinion, would make a lot more sense to go for. And so, we shall compare it to the Panzer Jaeger 1. Alright, so in front of your screen, I'm going to be throwing in uh, pictures of the stats so you can hear me speak the stats and also see them visually if you can't actually listen to me. If you haven't muted me already. <laughs> Uh, so the hit points are exactly the same on both tanks, uh, tank destroyers, at 120 health points. Uh, the Panzer Jaeger 1 has an advantage of an extra signal range of 10 meters, big whoop. Has a big advantage in terms of maximum speed at 40 kilometers per hour as opposed to 21 kilometers per hour. The tanks, well, the Panzer Jaeger 1 is more heavy, but uh, we'll see just down along the line. If it's possibly due to the engine being more superior. Crews are exactly the same. You have three man crews on them. Uh, you have battle tiers of two and three. Meaning you won't see anything higher than a, a level three tank. Level threes are the highest you'll see. You won't see level fours or anything higher than that. Armor wise. Panzer Jäger 1 has 13 millimeters all the way around. And the Renault FTAC has 60 millimeters all the way around. But you know what? 16 millimeters, 13 millimeters, it doesn't mean anything. Especially at low tiers like this and, and how it's a tank destroyer. 16 millimeters, anything could penetrate that. I could penetrate it with my finger. And I, a dirty mind already coming into play, but I could probably penetrate, never mind. Going too far with that. <laughs> In terms of mobility, the Panzer Jäger 1 has 100 horsepower on the engine. Remember how the Reno FT only had 45. Giving it also better... Uh, traverse speed at 34 degrees per second, and yeah, there you go, better better engine, just going to mean better acceleration, better traverse speed, going to reach its, uh, going to reach its maximum speed a lot quicker than the FT can, the Reno FTAC. In terms of the turret, this is when it gets a little bit interesting, remember how I was saying that the traverse arc for the Reno FT, it was given the specification that it should have about 6 degrees. Well, instead, World of Tanks gave it 9 degrees. So, I guess that's a buff. It's more than what was requested. That's always a good point. Uh, in terms of damage, the tanks do near enough exactly the same. Mind you, this is all the top equipment that you can get on the tanks. The Reno FT actually shoots faster. But in terms of damage per minute, they're doing about the same output, okay? Penetration-wise, near enough exactly the same. Per shell, the damage is less on the F the AC rather than the Jaeger 1. Uh, but yeah, damage per minute, exactly the same, near enough. With the elevation arc, another that interesting fact. Remember how the specification was meant to be plus or minus 15 degrees? Well, the elevation arc goes up to a maximum of plus 12 degrees on the Reno FTAC and a minimum of minus six, okay? 
So that's a big difference from minus 15. If you ask me, there are some tanks out there. I think the M2, for example, which goes minus 20, and that's absolutely ridiculous. But this tank doesn't even reach that minus 15, not even close. It stays at minus 6, and that's it. And you actually feel that gun, poor gun depression when you're out in this tank. Sometimes you'll be going on top of a hill, um, and you won't be able to look downwards just because you don't have that depression at all. Apart from that, the camouflage values are slightly better for the Reno FTAC. And that is it, folks. Yep, that is all the statistics. Now, let's take a look at what the armor values are like on this tank. I'm going to throw some pictures in front of you showing where to try to aim for this tank. And again, there's going to be no point of even showing you this picture. I don't even know why I'm doing this because it's just... As we were saying a few minutes ago, it's a tank destroyer and it's low tier. Anything's going to be able to penetrate it from any single angle. The heaviest armor is, of course, its body. It has slightly, like, one millimeter less on the actual uh, turret armor where the cannon is. And some of the lowest armor that you can find on this tank is actually where the gun is situated in. So if you really, really have to aim for something, if you just have some sort of complex or OCD... Okay, well, you can aim for the gun. It has the least amount of armor. And maybe it'll actually uh, damage the gun itself, critical it. So apart from that, guys, that is all the history and numbers that we need to talk about. Let's jump on into some games. All right, so the first one that we've got is on the map province, which if you're a normal person right now, you're probably screaming. Oh, no, not province, not this campish map. Krebs, why are you showing us this map? Well, I don't really have a choice. Uh, because I'm a, I'm a tier 2, it means that I'm put into these sort of matches more frequently. My god, I think I played about 10 matches in this tank today and half of them were on this map. But uh, the thing about this tank is, just like any other tank, I suppose you can universally say this, you have to play it right and with more tanks, well with some tanks more so than others. And this is one of them. The reason is, is because it's not a fast tank, okay? so. Basically with it, in the beginning, you're not going to be able to extend as far as you might want to. You have to take up usually a position that's close to your spawn. As you can see, that's what I've done just alongside this house over here. And nobody's spotted me, at least from what I can recognize at the moment. I'm a little bit out in the open, I do admit it. But it doesn't seem like anyone spotted me entirely or else I'd be getting shot. The general thing that I do on this map is I wait until I get shot because I don't got I don't have six cents, okay? If I had six cents, maybe I would be more keen on getting away. But since I don't have it, I usually do a general rule of I, I'll go somewhere and I'll wait until I get shot. If I get shot one time, I'm instantly out of there. I just move. And so that's why I haven't moved yet because I haven't gotten shot simply. Killed a number of guys so far. But what the enemy team is doing, and I suppose it happens on every single every single time on this map, is it just becomes a slugfest. You're exchanging shots right on across the map. It's whoever can be uh, the dumbest to poke themselves out and be exposed, and then who is more lucky with their shots, essentially. Sometimes what it boils down to. What's a really critical part of actually having success on this map, though, is you need people at the back, like I am, sniping. Then you also need people at the uh, front line, so usually scouts and such. And lucky to say that I at least got, what is that, one, two, two scouts up along the bottom right hand side of the map. Okay, so it's, it's doing something, I can get some sight on guys, but here we go. Getting my first shot on me and now I'm out of there. Because I know like, ugh, what is the point of, what is the point of hanging around this area if I'm going to be obviously sighted, they know I'm around this area, they might be even aiming at me right now even though they can't see me. And so I'm just gonna get killed. So it's time to move around, go on to the other side of the house, you can see that my teammate could probably use a little bit of help up here. And yeah, it's just doing a little bit of sniping. I actually think I forgot to read out the uh, accuracy values on this tank, but hey ho, I'm sure you guys could have seen it in the actual stats, you could probably read it off the screen. It's not too bad for sniping. It's actually quite accurate if you ask me. Like, look how far that is. That's... Ooh, 500 meters or so. You know, it's like five tiles or something like that around there. Maybe six. 
And I'm getting pretty accurate shots on, on these guys. I'm still going to be shooting in that direction because I realized the guy just disappeared. And maybe sometimes, if you keep on shooting at an area, you can get a shot. It's a bit more unpredictable when he's far away because I don't even know if the, my shots are landing on him in the first place. So that's a that's a no aside gone because one of our, my scouts died over there, so I can't get anyone uh, get any sight on anyone at the moment. I see that a tank is heading up along this direction. He just I don't even know what the hell that was. That was like an instant blow up on one of our teammates. <laughs> he got 160 damage. I'm not sure if that's like from a succession of damage because I didn't I didn't see the ammo rack explode. The actual symbol come up. So all I'm going to be doing, and this is the problem here, remember when we were talking about the gun depression being a bit wonky on this tank? Yeah, that's why I had to come straight on over this little tiny hill over here, this tiny incline, just so I could get aim on that tank or else I wouldn't be able to do it. And so sometimes that can put you in a bad position because if you have to come on top of a hill, well, you expose yourself simply, doesn't it? Alright, Krebs. It's just you and some teammates who's probably going to die in a second here. Your team is getting absolutely owned. You've got four kills. But it's not the kills that matter. I mean, in, in some respect, they do. So they don't have any many more guns firing. But for me, it's about the damage. How much damage do you do to the enemy team? You guys are going to see it in the end results. But uh, here we go. The enemy team is capturing my base. I know I'm screwed because there's tanks on every side. I'm by myself. I've got four kills. What am I supposed to do in this position? They're camping my base. And I know I can't expose myself out in the open. Or else I'm going to get shot. So my only real chance is probably going where I am right now. Get up closer behind this cover. And maybe I'll be able to see something. Can I see anything? Can I see anything? No. I can't see anything. Oh, for God's sake, that means I need to get even closer. Okay, time to move from cover to cover. I'm going to the house. I'm going to the house. Some guy is too directly behind me to my left. Oh, dear. And I still can't see anyone. Now there, now there's somebody. Oh, it's two of them. And now I know if I want to come down there, my poor depression angle. Yeah, I'm going to get killed. That's exactly what happens. N nothing you can do at that point. I mean, you're a tank destroyer. Your gun depression is bad. Uh, you know, and your base is being captured times against you. So you can go ahead and take a look at the damage. I got around 330, which is okay. Uh, but let's jump on into the next game. All right, so this time we're on south side Himmelsdorf. Kind of strange map to play on as a tank destroyer, especially this one, because when we were speaking in the last match, we were talking about the limitations of the engine, so there's absolutely zero point for me going on top of the hill. For one, it would take too long to even go up there, and two, if I was going up there and somebody happened to be at the top of the hill, and I needed to take him on, because of my poor depression, I might not be even able to shoot him unless I completely expose myself. The other thing is that I probably shouldn't go along the uh, lane in, what is that, eight? In, in row, column 8 rather, because if I go that direction, knowing that how tank destroyers are and you ha don't have a fully rotatable turret, you have a locked position turret, you have to show off your entire body and going down along the alleyway would just be certain death. Maybe I could shoot one person, but I'd literally get off a single shot before I'd die, so there's no point of going along that lane. If I'd used cover behind my en my teammates, I'd still probably die because I'm a tank destroyer, I have less health, I'm easy to penetrate. And so I'm kind of restricted to either going in the middle or along the left hand side of the map where I am right now. I was originally thinking going maybe on the on the tracks where the railroad is because that's like almost a, a tank destroyer a haven if anything because uh, you can snipe from far away, usually you're Faster tanks are out there scouting, so yeah, it's a good place to go for. And also where I am right now isn't that bad as well. Got some good cover, and I can see right down along this alleyway. No idea what the hell this uh, Cunningham, I think it was? No, it was T1E6. Uh, was doing, just suicidal, I guess. <laughs> suicidal much. And now the enemy team is in presence along the left-hand side. Surprisingly, uh, our guys seem to be doing alright in r r column 8. Okay, there's a tank destroyer there as well, I can see that. 
Anyway, I see a BT2, I believe that is. Yeah, it's a BT2 who's just behind me, who finished off my teammate. My teammate didn't even manage to get off a shot on him. And now I'm just thinking to myself, oh dear. Uh, I know what BT2s are like. They're fast and agile and probably a worse nightmare for a tank destroyer. Not only can they penetrate me every time because I'm a tank destroyer, but they can easily circle around me and I can't do anything to him. So I'm trying to get off into a defensive position close to the wall. Uh, so I expose the, as least as possible. And if he does come out, then hopefully he won't be able to circle around me because I've got a wall beside me. Okay. Oh, I see him. Might as well fire. Maybe get a lucky shot underneath those uh, rail carts. But now I'm just looking on the map. Where is he going? I saw briefly that he was heading down south. So I doubt he's going to be coming this direction. All I'm going to do now is take up a defensive position on this corner. Because if he comes along here, which I'm anticipating him to come into the capture our base, then I'll be able to kill him. And if he comes up behind me, I can easily move up forward and quickly rotate and hopefully get some damage. Anyway, but he's capturing the base of my T. Oh, dear. I was going to say he, well, he was my T-60, mate. He's gone now. <laughs> he's definitely dead. And oh, my gosh, BT2 giving me the break that I needed. I was afraid I might have to come around that corner. But he actually moved around, and that is perfect for me. Just means I can shoot him, and there we go. He's gone. He should have moved when, while we could. He just stayed there like a duck. I mean, you know, get some damage off on me, but he could have probably stayed alive and maybe tried circling around me. Anyway, taking up a defensive position against the carcass on my T60 just in case that they start coming in from uh, that alleyway along 679JH and E, F, F, I can't read my screen, I'm sorry. Anyway, finishing off the M2 light tank, because who cares, I can and he's still playing defensively. They have three tanks left on their team. Wary that one of them might still come down the alleyway, but as you can see on the mini map, he's been spotted. And he's gonna be engaging my teammate. Now I'm thinking to myself, how the hell has my teammate not died? It's because my teammate's done something pretty uh pretty uh cunning. And actually a good defensive position. You'll see it in a second when we move up there. But yeah, that guy's absolutely screwed. From behind, he's getting shot from what the H35? Yeah, other French tank. He's gone. T60 gone. There we go. You see what that T my teammate has done? <laughs> he's taking up a defense position right in the rubble over here, and that's why no tanks were able to get him. They were trying to come around. Pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, guys. This is pretty much the end of the replay because what's going to happen now is we're going to capture the enemy base and the last enemy tank is hiding, I believe, in A1 or somewhere around there. Pussy. <laughs> so I might as well just skip on over to the results. I hope you enjoyed this episode and until next time, I will catch you all later. Right, here we go. Three, two, one.